Hello everyone, welcome to the Hard Room. I'm Travis Bruce and today I have a special guest with us. He is an author and he has a short story that is in the anthology series that's out right now that's called Flash of the Undead and the story is called The Incident at the Fairfield. I have with us Joshua Weiss. Joshua, welcome to the Hard Room. Thank you for having me here. It's wonderful to be here. It's a pleasure, man. It's a pleasure to have you on. Now tell us a little bit about The Incident at the Fairfield. Well, um, I write for Wicked Shadow Press, and they put out anthologies that generally have a theme. And so this one involved undead uh, creatures. And the incident at the Fairfield is about a, uh, a, an anatomical museum uh, that has a, a quite special exhibit. And I, I don't, I'm not sure how much I should give away here, because I'd love for people <laughs> to read it. Yes. Um, it is available on... Uh, EPUB and paperback through that press, but it's also available on my website for free. Everything I've ever published is also on my site for free, so I, I'd love for people to go there and, and give it a shot for themselves. It's a very short read, um, and so it'll give you a good idea of where I go with my writing. Now, now you, you're a pretty young and new writer. What made you decide to start doing horror writing? Uh, well, I um, I don't know about young, <laughs> but I'm new. Uh, I knew it right in a career. Been, yeah, yeah, <laughs> very true. Uh, I I've written things in the past. Uh, I was a part of a a local theater troupe, and I produced uh, original things for them, like ten minute plays, very short, mostly comedy. Um, but I always liked horror stories. I I liked classic things. I loved uh, Lovecraft. I loved uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Things like that. Um, and I just thought, well, you know, these are short. I could probably take a stab at it. And if I fail, you know, it, it didn't take too much time out of my personal life to go for it, but I was interested in it and it was a departure from stage writing and comedy writing. And so I, I wrote something and it kind of sat in my computer for two or three months. And then this, uh, opportunity to be in an anthology popped up. And I submitted it and got accepted. And then I've, I've kind of rolled with it ever since. And it's been wonderful. My, my main hobby and uh, hopefully something that uh, can lead somewhere in the future. Although if it stays a hobby, I'm happy with that too. Now, and, and that's amazing. And, and right now, I mean, you know, being an indie horror writer, it's a good time because, like, you know, it's, it's, it's easier for writers to get their work out whether it be with a small publishing or a small press but what are some struggles that you have ran into and probably a lot of new writers have run into that if you're thinking somebody's watching and you're thinking about being a writer don't know about well uh, the biggest one for me if you could always put things out yourself um i would say i have two struggles i'd like to uh, go over because i think they're both very important for new writers to know um the first is like uh, people who you think would be really supportive of you, they're so outside doing their own thing that it's really hard. It's harder to get friends to read my things than it is to get strangers and, and um, people who are already into reading horror anthologies or uh, things in that genre. So if you write something and you show your friends and their reaction isn't this big uh overwhelming amount of enthusiasm or positivity, um, don't let that discourage you. I'd say the first thing you need to do uh, to make sure you do is write for yourself. You know, so I did it because I liked it. Uh, and my story stayed on my computer, like I said, for a while. And that was fine with me. Now, the second thing that I experienced was a lot of publishers. It seems like even though there are a lot of places to be published, um, if you're trying to get into something that's that's a book or a magazine or even an online magazine or something like that, it seems like it's very hard to get people's attention. And uh, in my case, uh, I submitted things to two or three different publications and didn't even hear back for months. And now I'm, I've only been doing this for a year. So to, in some cases, it was three or four months before I heard uh, that they weren't interested in one particular piece I submitted. But they also have clauses that say, you know, if you submit uh, and you submit simultaneously to other publishers, please let us know. And you always wonder how that affects your ability to be accepted and things like that. Yeah. And so uh, I was very lucky to stumble on to the, the several presses that have published me so far. 
um, early into my writing career, and uh, they've put a lot of things out and have included me in a lot of their things, so I've been very happy with that. So if you are considering doing your own thing, anybody out there who's listening, I would say um, consider submitting things to a variety of different presses. And smaller is okay. Don't try. Don't look for ones that might pay you right away. I personally haven't really received anything financially for what I've done so far, um, but that's okay because in the future, I, I'm assembling a portfolio that I could use in the future to give me better opportunities if I ever do want to pursue it uh, more as a career or as a more serious hobby. So I would say those are the big things. Expect smaller reactions from your friends than you uh, <laughs> might anticipate. Mm -hmm. And then I've got really wonderful reactions from fellow writers. So um, it's not been negativity across the board or anything like that. Just the people you think would cheer for you, sometimes they, they, it's like, oh, yeah, good, good job. Mm -hmm. and, and that might be the extent of their, their feedback for you. So be okay with that. And secondly, just submit, 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 and, and try and find the publisher that's right for you. you know? and, that, and that would be it. And I agree with the statement that you made. Like, I mean, even like, so, so I, I'm, I'm only a, a, a little bit over, I mean, over a year into my YouTube channel career. And yeah, I mean, I, I had 250 friends on Facebook and I, and, and a lot of them I knew liked horror. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm at least get them to subscribe to my channel. I might have five of those original 250 friends that are actually subscribers and actually support my channel. My other thirteen hundred, I mean, I mean, subscribers. I mean, they're complete strangers, and and, and it was kind of shocking that you know I got I've gotten more support from complete strangers than people who are in my life. You know? Yeah. Well, they're fans of the genre, and and maybe that's a healthy thing. Like, I don't personally need I I need fans. <laughs> I think, <Yes. laughs> but I don't need I don't need fans of me. I need uh, fans of what I do, and I need fans of people who like that stuff in general, and so. Uh, meaningful support for me is is anything that anyone says, taking the time to read something. If you go to m my website and see things and, and you read it and it, find out it's not for you, that's still meaningful for me because you tried it, you know? Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, it can be a, a bit of a struggle to kind of get the ball rolling uh, with with strangers and, and with uh, uh, even among people you know. And um, so one of the things also too, like, I mean, there's, there's, I've heard indie horror authors say, you know, have horror stories about certain publishers and small presses that they've dealt with. Um, what made you decide to choose a small press that you're working with? Uh, well, it, it wasn't that complicated. They, they put out a lot of submission requests. They're very upfront. It's, um, there's no pay, you know, some places have contests and I, I, there are legitimate contests out there, I'm sure, but it is a bit, um, it rankles me, I guess I could say, if I'm having to submit something to you and pay some money and then there's not, uh, how good is my chance of getting into this publication and what happens to that money? Is it solely used for printing or is someone pocketing that? So uh, the publisher I work with, the two that I work with were very upfront. It's, um, you get a free copy of uh, the book when it comes out. You don't get paid for it. Uh, but the benefits to them were uh, they had a very quick turnaround time and uh, uh, they seem to put out a lot of things. And so if you miss one, you have a chance pretty quickly to get on, on the next one. It's been almost monthly, to be honest. They're really quick. So I've, I've really enjoyed that. And I understand that you're also working as a uh, feature editor with them as well. It's it just um, we haven't cemented anything yet. But with the publisher that I'm working with, um, because every time they have an anthology, they they want a theme to it. Uh, for example, the story that you mentioned, uh, the incident at the Fairfield, it was Flash of the Undead, so it's undead creatures. Um, I had an idea for a theme and just casually on Facebook submitted it to um, one of their current editors and they said, we really like this idea. Would you like to do uh, that book for us? And I'm traveling right now. Uh, when I get back to my home base, um, I'm going to talk with them further and we'll cement some details. And I don't want to reveal anything 
uh, about the topic yet, but that will be coming up in the near future. And so I'm very excited about that. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Now, right now, I mean, and, and I've asked this question a couple of times, um, in the indie horror author community, it seems like there's a lot of unrest. There's a lot of pulling apart and a lot of drama. And I, I, I personally, from an outsider, I don't understand it because I feel like all indie horror creators are kind of equal. You, you know what I mean? Like, it, you, you, we're, we're, you're fighting the same fight. Why do you think a, some of that is happening? Well, it's I can only speculate because I'm really new at all of this. But I would say I I get kind of a similar vibe. Now I haven't experienced a lot of this directly, so I uh, this isn't from personal experience. But whenever there is a specific genre of something that people like, uh, there there are people that want to uh, gatekeep isn't the word I'm looking for, but they really want to ensure that it's pure. But everyone has different ideas of what purity is. Um, and I really, um, I have more experience, at least in my media consuming past, with things like punk music. And that genre seemed at one point to eat itself with people saying, that's not punk and this is punk. And yeah. they spent so much time and effort deciding what they, what constituted their their core genre that they, they couldn't just open their mind and enjoy what people were making at the time. And I think... In this, uh, it, at least with my writing, I get published through um, Wicked Shadow Press and Culture Cult Press, and they they say they're horror. Um, a lot of my stories are horror, or they have horror elements to them, but I, I don't think they would be the scariest thing on the block. I think they're the things I do are designed to really have a have a twist in them or a thought in them that really catches you and, and makes you see something in a way that you hadn't considered before, um, hopefully. Uh, but I'm sure there would, pe there would be people out there who would read things that I've done and say, you know, that's not what horror is. Hor pure horror, or um, maybe they add another adjective to it. You, you don't know Southern horror. You don't know, <laughs> you don't know dark horror. You don't know um, gore or something like that. And I find uh, I like writing when I write what I feel the peace demands of me, you know? So if I, if I start with an idea that seems scary, but it, it takes a turn and ends up having kind of a warm ending, I'm not afraid to do that because it's my story. And it, mm -hmm. it, as a, as an artist, to the extent that I'm an artist, it leads me to that place. And I, if I don't fight it to try and shove it into a particular box, it seems to be a much more interesting story. And I think, um, people who, take the opposing view and want to, um, I guess, spend their energy defining what the genre is, they could define it for themselves, but it won't change the things that I write and hopefully the things that people choose to read. And like you said earlier, you know, it's, it's your story. You're writing a story for yourself. So, like, listening to other people, at the end of the day, horror is, is, is a thing. But there's so many subgenres in horror. So I mean, it's it's hard to classify what's horror and what's not because there's so many different subgenres. Oh, absolutely. And then approaches. And then um, I I don't know if someone would consider things like this a horror, but um, some of my favorite movies. Um, I love Army of Darkness. It's like that's horror. Hor yeah, that's a horror mm -hmm. movie, but that's a it's a comedy. Shaun of the Dead's like that. And then on the other side, you've got uh, a movie that I really, really love would be Event Horizon, which is like a sci-fi horror Great movie. Great movie. That's an excellent movie. And then I heard your interview with, um, was it was it J.J. Carpenter that you were talking to or someone else uh, talking about The Candyman? Yes. I, I, that movie scared me so much. Scared. It scared, scared me. me. Yes. But then also another, another one. When I was really young, I saw these way too young, but I saw um, Aliens the, the mm -hmm. uh, James Cameron aliens and predator and those creatures uh, did it for me. Those gave me nightmares. Um, so all of those, you could, you could easily dispute their claim to be a horror movie based on one part of the story. 
like, oh, Aliens is an action movie, or, um, you know, uh, Army of Darkness is a comedy, or things like that. But they all have a similar uh, emotional charge to them in some way. They've got uh, an energy related to dark things. And I think that is what I find appealing, you know. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I feel about the genres in general. I like what I like, and they seem to have a similar charge to them. And it might not have a convenient title. But it's still, it doesn't make it not worthy of uh, your time and attention. I agree. Because, I mean, the biggest argument that I would have on my channel is, I always say that the Alien movies and even the Predator movies are horror movies. And people say, oh, no, they're action movies or they're sci-fi. But they have horror, they have serious, big horror, horror elements to them. So why can't they be a horror sci-fi or a horror action why can't you take horror and put another genre to it you know absolutely or you could even flip it upside down and say all right what would you have to change about predator to someone who disagrees with you what would you have to change to make that a horror movie is it not violent enough is it not scary enough in terms of what's happening to the characters they're being hunted by a, a demon from space you yeah. know what else would you need to change is it simply the presentation like that they, they have a lot of guns with them um, and a lot of muscles, you know? Is that all that takes it out of that horror realm, uh, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't know. I, 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 um, I don't mind having that kind of conversation with people as long as everyone can say that it's their feeling and their opinion. But if there's someone who, who wants to really argue about it, it's kind of like, well, you like what you like, and that's it. Yeah. I'm not going to change your mind. <laughs> I agree. Because I was, I mean, I was convinced um, I had an author on, and we did a live. We were talking about talented Mr. Ripley and Saltburn. And like before we even did it, she was like, she, she brought the idea up to me. I was like, are those horror movies? And then she like started, we started talking about it. I was like, oh my goodness, they are horror movies. Yes, they're not bloody and gory, but they have all of the elements of horror movies. So, I mean, she's going to open your mind up. I mean, there's a lot more movies that most people don't think are horror movies, but if you sat down and you broke it down, they're horror. I mean, they have that primal fear. Yeah. They have the suspense. They have a story that is... It's a story that you would not want to be in that situation. And, that's, and when you get into those stories where it's a terrifying situation that you would not want to be in personally that's horror yeah fear uh the idea of unknown the unknown elements you know those things i think are the appealing part of the genre there's something that is uh, stoking your fear your sense of, of terror and then there's something that you don't know about it and then maybe the third component would be you are not sure how to extricate yourself from that situation and so you have uh, movies like The Conjuring, which are horror movies. It has all of those things straight across the board, right? And then, again, turning to uh, Army of Darkness, you, as a viewer, may not feel those things, but you have to think about the character's perspective. He's been sure. sucked back in time. He's being pursued by these evil forces. He doesn't know what to do. And uh, that's, that meets all those tick boxes, too. It's just not something that you experience that way as a viewer, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm comfortable with the widest possible definition of horror. And I, I feel that's fine. I, and I'm the same boat. Now, as an author um, who writes a lot of short stories, has there ever been a short story that you were writing? You're like, oh, my goodness, this will this will be great as a either a, like a novella or even a novel? Uh, well, I had... The publisher that I work with, because it's an anthology and there are lots of other writers that are contributing, sometimes they have uh, flash fiction, so it's a hard cap of 1,500 words. Sometimes they limit you to 8,000 words. And there's been a few times uh, that I've bumped up against that limit and said, man, if I just had 1,000 more, I could really wrap this up in a way that I would love. Um, there's been a few ideas that if... I took the short story and I fleshed it out. It could be a novella, and I, I would love to do that in the future. That's a personal goal of mine. One great thing about um, everything that I've published so far is I've retained the rights to it. And so I can, um, 
when I get enough of them, I could put out my own collection with only my work and there's no limit. So I could take these stories, I could add what I initially might have wanted to add to them and uh, put it out. I could change anything I wanted to uh, about them. Uh, things that maybe I originally envisioned but uh, had to cut out or things that I just had to alter because I ran out of time to submit them. Um, so I've had a few ideas like that. Um, but I've been very lucky that all of the things work very well as short stories as well. So if I made it bigger, if I made it substantially bigger, I would want it to be, I, would, I wouldn't want to put filler there. I would want yeah. it to be important what I add to it. But I'm In not opposed universe. to doing that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, now, is, uh, now, now I, because, and I've talked to a lot of um, authors who write short stories. I can imagine, and you brushed on a little bit, I can imagine it is hard to tell your full story that, you know, the meat and potatoes, the beginning, the middle, and end, and tied up in a nice little bow with a short story. It, it must be tough. I mean, you, you have to, it's, like you were saying, it, it, has, it might be big chunks that you want to put in, but you have to cut it out. Oh, well, maybe this is another uh, bit of information for any aspiring writer out there. And it sounds weird because I've only been doing it in this genre and in this way for a year. But I've had the best success when I follow what I call the 85% rule. And maybe someone else has a similar name for it. I, I'm not the inventor of this rule. Mm -hmm. But when I write something and there's a hard deadline or a hard word count, if it's 85% what I intended it to be, then I'm fine with it because I could spend another 10 days making it 10% better, but I might miss the deadline. Or I could spend another 3,000 words making it 10% better, but then I've exceeded a word count. So if you get comfortable with this, um, you take a swing and you get a triple instead of a home run or a double instead of a triple. If, if you're satisfied with that, my biggest satisfaction is knowing that it's, it's getting out there. And so when the publisher puts out what I've uh, written, even if it's not exactly what I wanted, it's so close to it that I'm, I'm fine with it. And so um, it also may, it eases up on me a bit. It takes some of the pressure off of me because I can, I can say, oh, I think I could have done better, but it's okay. I can be all right with this. It's a good story. You know? And so that's how I feel about um, those little um, compulsions we all have to tweak and, and fiddle with it ad nauseum. You'll never stop yeah. if you, you get to some point, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it'll drive you crazy. <laughs> now, <clears throat> when it comes to your writing, do you, are, do you have an ending in mind or is that something you usually have to work towards? Uh, well, it, it varies depending on uh, what the category is, what the topic is for the particular anthology. That's where I've done uh, almost all of my work is with anthologies. In some cases, I've had something that was very close to an ending. I don't have the exact, like the last sentence or the last paragraph, but I have a stopping point that I want. And then I have some that are just a quirky idea that I think I need to run with. And then it goes back to letting it be its own thing, where if it, if it goes uh, to point A or to point B, it's gone somewhere. And if I can make it something that I imagine the reader would be satisfied with, that's okay too. Um, so uh, the incident at the Fairfield, which you mentioned, is one uh, that started as an idea and probably uh, the ending-ish was in my head, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with it. It was basically what could be boiled down to about two sentences in my mind before I started writing it. It's a particular creature having a particular experience. And then I had to build the story around it. Uh, but when I came to the ending, I was happy with it. And that's that 85% rule again. Maybe I could have made a better ending if I spent another month on it, but I didn't have a month. And so uh, I was okay. Now, Joshua, as you know, you watch my channel. So I do this every once in a while. I'm asking you three random horror questions. It's a personal okay. opinion. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, let's go for it. All right. First one. What is one horror movie that most people love that you feel is overrated? Oh, um, what was, I'm, 
I'm going to get the name wrong. What was uh, Jordan Peele's one? Get Out? It might have been that one. I, I think it was Get Out. What was the one that took place on the the, the like the circus fairground or the amusement oh, park? Oh, that's Nope. Nope. Was it Nope? Yes. Not the, the, Wasn't that the one with um, like aliens in it? But it, nope was aliens. No, hold on. So, so get out was the black guy who was going home to meet the white girl. I liked friend. that one quite a lot. But then I the one, he, one, the one he did after that, I didn't like Us. so much. Yeah, Us. I think yes. that one. It just didn't do it for me. I felt like the story was convoluted. I kind of wanted it to stick on on a single path that that followed something more than taking a lot of the twists and turns that it did. It just seemed a bit too. Um, I wanted a tree. He gave me a bush. <laughs> you know, yes. it's just everywhere. Um, it doesn't mean it's bad. If people are watching and you love it, that's absolutely great. It just didn't do it for me. So that that would be uh, my answer for that one. Not great for you. I'm not an US fan. I love Get Out, but I'm not an US fan at all. Uh, second question. Okay. What is this, what's a horror movie that you think that you love that you th that you don't think gets enough attention? Ooh, it'd have to be, I'd have to go back to Event Horizon. I think that um, it did a great job, personally, for me, blending horror elements and science fiction elements in a way that was believable, but it didn't seem like anything was jammed in. It didn't pride itself too much on scientific accuracy to allow that to get in the way of the spooky elements. You know, it didn't feel like it needed to answer every question, uh, and it was genuinely scary. And uh, well done as a film. I really loved that one. So I think um, that would be my answer for that. That movie definitely gave me nightmares as a kid. <laughs> oh, of course. Sam Neill in that one. He was yeah. great. That movie was terrifying. Terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. And a final question is, who would be on your Mount Rushmore of horror villains? Oh, that's another tough one. Again, using the widest definition of horror. Um, and this is just for me because I think there are horror villains that would have to be. Uh, so Freddy Krueger would have to be up there for mm -hmm. for people. But it, it wouldn't be for me just because I'm going with the ones oh, that you're, I have. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're personal. Uh, so I would say uh, Alien, a creature that seems... Uh, indestructible at least if you destroy it it kills you too it bleeds all over you uh it's absolutely terrifying predators up there for me something that's just that much for uh so far advanced beyond uh what we're capable of doing so i think that's up there for me too i'd say a third horror villain oh that is so tough um if i was going to Go with um, just something. Maybe th this is a cop out answer, um, but I I really feel like Rafe Fiennes from Schindler's List. Now that's not a horror movie at all, but his portrayal it, it, was so it <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah. I I should rephrase it. It it doesn't meet this <laughs> what we generally think of as horror, yeah. but I think his depiction is so good that that would that just be like palpable evil you know and and so if anything could be given a pass it would be that character and then the fourth um i always thought like uh tim curry and it i think he was just yeah absolutely um gave that character life you know it could have so easily turned into uh a source of mockery if you just didn't do it right but he yeah. did it so well, you know, and so that would, those would be, maybe if I sat down, again, 85% rule, if I sat down, I might be able to come up with four better ones, but those really do it for me, you know. Now, I'm going to show you how big of a horror nerd and guru I am. So, so and I'm going to give you some, uh, um, I don't think most people know about The Predator. One of the reasons I love The Predator character so much, now, the movies, that's a different story, but The Predator lore, the Predator was originally um, here to protect humans. And he was protecting humans from the Xenomorphs, which are the aliens, from aliens. And because that's their... And 
But but the predator, if you notice in the movies, and they don't shine it on it as much, the predator will not. If you are unarmed, child, woman, and you're not trying to cause him any harm, he's not going to kill you. He's not going to do nothing to you. He's going to walk right by you. He is looking for someone who is a a who is challenging him to a fight. That's what he is. He's a hunter. He's looking for. He's looking for the best match. So as soon as you grab a gun or a knife, that's why he's always goes to places where there's huge violence, you know, because he wants to, he's trying to look for the, a worthy challenger in wherever he goes. But the, the predator is not going to attack you if you do not show him, if you don't signal to him, I'm, I'm trying to fight you. Oh yeah, absolutely. So that would be my saving grace in that situation. I'd yes, I would just run. Ball and then, I'll just uh, run. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't even run. I'd curl up in a ball. Let him yeah. walk away from me. <laughs> he's not, he's not going to hurt you. So if you ever run to a predator or anyone, the last thing you do is pull out a gun or try to hit it with a car or anything. Do not do that because then he's saying, you you want to play with me. He's, he's signaling that you want to play with him. And you don't do that with Predator, you're going to lose every single time. Absolutely, uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, Joshua, where can everyone find you? Uh, I have a website, uh, joshuadvice.com. Uh, that's V-I-S-E, like the tool. Um, so you could find everything that I've published uh, appears there in the short story section. And I add to it every time something comes out. Um, if you look on Facebook, I'm there too, but that's... Uh, I. It's mostly kind of marketing stuff, and I'd recommend you check out Wicked Shadow Press and Culture Cult Press also on Facebook. Uh, don't just do it as a fan. Get into the writing aspect of it, too. They have constant uh, calls for new stories, for um, new anthologies. Really take advantage of that opportunity because, like I said earlier in the interview, they are a great stepping stone to get a lot of published works under your belt. Uh, whereas other places might keep you waiting for longer, may take longer to deny you, uh, or things like that. So I've been very happy with them uh, so far, and I hope that relationship continues. Awesome. Listen, everybody, get over there and follow Joshua and share some support. Also, grab your copy of Flash of the Undead as well. Available at Lulu, lulu.com. Lulu.com. All right, everyone, thank you for coming to the Horror Ram. I'm Travis Bruce, and that's Joshua Vice. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>